Episode 22, Understanding Camera Lenses. Welcome to the Visionary Variety Podcast, where we cover cool stuff like photo, video, film, books, and technology. So switch on your brain and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Visionary Variety Podcast. Today we have a special solo episode, as we call them, where it's just going to be me this time. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about something that is near and dear to my heart. In case you have not caught on if, or if you're new to the podcast, this is a variety podcast, <laughs> hence the name. So that means we cover nerdy stuff, books, movies, but we also cover other things like photography and video and technology, the other stuff that we also love, especially Nate and I. So I am, as many of you probably know by now, I am a photographer. And lenses is a really important subject when it comes to photography equipment, uh, operation, and also what to buy. I saw this topic come up on a photography group recently, and I could tell that the person posting it did not quite understand what they meant to say when it comes to the lenses. They were looking for a specific look, but they thought it was in the camera body. But in fact, this is a property of the lens that they should have been looking for. And of course, I commented and let them know what was what. Uh, but it just reminded me that, hey, lenses is a often misunderstood topic, especially when it comes to the camera body versus what lens to get. So that's why I figured this would be a, a good, easy topic for me to just rattle off real quick off the top of my head mostly. And this will be a great reference to have for the future in case this issue comes up again. I can say, hey, I did a podcast episode about that. Here's a link. And I would really love it if you guys shared these as well. It really helps us get the word out and get some new fans and listeners. All right, well, let's get started. So like I said, a popular question that I see pop up a lot is what's more important, the camera body or the lens? Now, they are a bit apples to oranges, but when they're talking about image quality or the ability to focus or shoot a specific kind of photography, really the weight of that is more on the lens, in my opinion. So uh, I'm not going to say it's all about the lens. Like you, you can make incredible images if you have a crappy camera and an amazing lens. That's not always true. There are limitations in the camera body that can prevent you from getting a specific look that you want or from shooting a specific type of photography very well. So you do have to understand the roles of both parts, but I would say it's almost 70%, maybe it's hard to make an exact number on it, of course, but I'm going to say very roughly, maybe 70% is in the lens. And if you shop for equipment, you have probably noticed, wow, lenses are really expensive. At least the good ones are. If you're shopping for cheap lenses, you're going to get cheap lenses and you're going to get cheap images through them. So it is important to invest a lot of money in lenses because of how much important is on them because of what they do and sometimes because of what they don't do and also because it really does shape your image as it comes through the lens obviously and then hits your sensor so the glass that it goes through is very vital and is a crucial part of the whole equation of making a great image so for example have you ever looked through a really bad people like in a door uh, you know you're in an apartment or a house you look through the people to try to see someone that's out there knocking and you can't quite tell who it is you know it's fuzzy and blurry and the, it's really warped and you can't quite see where their head is and it's just not a good piece of glass I know this is a weird example but it does kind of get the point across when you're using cheap lenses it's going to be cheap glass and also cheap plastic that holds the glass and cheap motors that turn the glass and cheap everything so they will break more often they will not be as quick to focus they will not be as accurate or as good in the fine detail spots um, as a, a really expensive and nicer lens so there are changes this is not just because the companies say well i think we should sell this lens for 2000 this for 150 there's legitimate reasons scientifically so it's important to invest your money in a good lens now, for quite a few years, all that I had was, other than my kit lenses, which I stopped using when I realized they were not good for me, <laughs> all that I really used was a 50 millimeter uh, f1.4, the Canon lens. It costed about $350 at the time, and boy, that was a lot of money for me to spend because I was barely making anything. But I went ahead and bought it, and man, I love that lens. I still have it, and I still love it. And I used this lens for about, I calculated at one time, I did about 10 weddings in a row, almost with just this lens. Now, I know my wedding photographer for are probably cringing right now thinking what is wrong with you why would you use just one 50 millimeter lens for multiple weddings and you're right <laughs> it was a bad idea in the end but you know what it taught me how to use that lens well it taught me how to zoom with my feet how to use what I had and luckily or for the most part I had enough room to move back enough to get groups and stuff like that but uh, I did get into a few sticky situations where I couldn't shoot inside a small room you know the bride's getting ready in, in a room with her girls and mom and I just could not quite capture what I wanted to because that lens could not zoom out all that to say, 
50 millimeter is uh, my, my first love. Now I have since upgraded and I have uh, three main lenses that I use, which we'll get into. And they allow me to capture the whole range of action from things far away to very small rooms and stuff, uh, people up in my face. So before we get into the technical stuff and I start talking about the fun, juicy things about what lens to buy and why and this and that, we need to establish a few vocabulary words so that we are all on the same page, especially for the new people, so that we understand these fancy big words I'm using, you're going to know what the heck I'm saying because it is important. So let's do a little vocabulary real quick. We've got a few words here. The first one is aperture. The aperture is the adjustable opening in the lens similar to our pupil and our eye. You know, when it's dark, our pupil opens up or when you're drunk, it's dilated. <laughs> uh, and when it's really bright outside, your pupil closes down because it's so much light. Uh, lenses similarly have an adjustable pupil inside of them and it's called the aperture. If you recall the old opening of the 007 movies, it's a silhouette of James Bond walking against the white background. He turns and shoots and there's like a, a mechanical closing that closes in on him from all sides. It's like a set of circular bleeds that close in and then eventually the whole screen is closed down. That is an aperture. Uh, that's what they look like. If you're still confused, type in mechanical aperture in Google Images and you'll see some really cool stuff. Uh, so they close to darken the image and let it let in less light and they open wide to let in more light. And that is also measured in F stops. So you might see f2.8. That's a larger opening, whereas f16 or f5.6 is a smaller hole and less light, darker image. All right, moving on. Focal length. The focal length of a lens is the distance inside of the lens from the point where your image is focused within the glass elements to the sensor. So that distance is the focal length. Now, if you have a zoom lens, it's probably maybe a, a 70 to 300 or a 70 to 200 millimeter. So that is the measurement of the focal length physically inside the lens. Um, when you're zoomed in close to something really far away, you can have a higher number. That means the focal length is greater. And that's why when you twist that zoom ring, you're going to see things moving and going in and out of your lens. That distance is increasing, thus giving you a longer focal length. And in the real world, that just means we're zooming in closer. All right, moving on. So that's focal length, whereas a fixed focal length lens is a lens that has a fixed focal length. <laughs> I know, mind blown. But this is important to understand because a fixed focal length lens is one that cannot zoom in or zoom out. Like my 50 millimeter, it's just that. It's not a 50 to 100, it's not a 28 to 50, it's just 50. So when I said zoom with my legs, that's what it is. You got to zoom with your legs. You got to run and walk and step and try not to trip backwards. If you want to get a bigger scene where you got to move in real close with your feet by moving physically to change your image. All right, next word is a prime lens. And that pretty much is just a fancier word for a fixed focal length lens. But also prime lenses come with the connotation that they are higher quality and thus much more expensive. But hey, you get your money's worth when you buy a good lens. So a prime lens is a fixed focal length lens of higher quality and sharpness. They have less vignetting, which is the darkness around the edges of your image. They often have a much better maximum f-stop such as 2.8 or 1.4 or 1.2. That would be great if you don't have a lot of light to work with, whereas cheaper lenses cannot get that bright, maybe a maximum of 3.5 or 4.0, and that's what you get. You got it. You hit that ceiling, if you will, of how much light you can let in. Um, but a prime lens can usually get much brighter, and, uh, and it's really nice. All right, next word, glass. This is kind of a slang term for a lens. Like someone comes up like, oh, what glass are you using on that camera? Or are you going to buy some new glass this year? You know, that's just slang word for a lens because in case you haven't noticed, there's a lot of glass inside of a lens. That's why it's heavy. And the really big fancy ones are really heavy because there's big old chunks of glass inside that lens that are moving and uh, adjusting and things like that. And the better quality glass, the better your image is going to be. And the more expensive the lenses. I feel like I've said that a lot. <laughs> All right, bokeh or bokeh. This word is often misused and a little bit misunderstood. I'm still kind of wrapping my head around it as I've done the research for this episode. But basically, bokeh is the quality of the out-of-focus parts of the image, whether in the far background or also in the foreground in front of your subject. Let's say I'm doing a portrait of somebody. I've zoomed in real close to their face. I focused on their eye, and I've got a small f-stop number like f2.8. That means the background is generally going to be pretty blurry. And the quality of that blur, whether it's a nice-looking blur where it's soft, Soft and smooth and creamy, um, with really nice uh, dots of light coming through the trees, or, or the you know the lights in the background. If it's a city scene, um, that's a that's a good bokeh. You can have a bad bokeh apparently if the if the edges look jagged and distracting and weird. Then again, that will be with cheaper lenses. All right, so that's bokeh. Autofocus. Nearly all lenses now have a tiny little motor built into them that allows the lens to focus. So 
for example, on my Canon at least, I hold my half press button and the motor starts turning and the lens starts f trying to find the sharpest point wherever I've pointed my lens, based on a few settings, of course. So the autofocus is a feature that pretty much all lenses have today. If you find a lens that doesn't have autofocus, you might want to second guess buying it. It's either very old and just a manual lens, or maybe it's a specialty lens without the autofocus motor built in for some obscure reason. <laughs> but autofocus is your friend and even professionals still use it. I have had to use manual focus a few times, but uh, pretty much 99% of the time I'm relying on autofocus within my lens. All right, conversely, manual focus is the opposite. A manual focus lens is one that does not have a built-in motor for electronic focusing, and you must do it manually, aka with your hands. Normally, the focus ring is the very last ring on a lens, although sometimes they're a little bit different, but you turn that with your hand, you know, clockwise, counterclockwise, and your image will come in and out of focus. Then you've got to use your eye looking through your viewfinder or perhaps your screen and find where you want to be in focus and shoot your picture. All right, next term is the lens diameter or the filter size. This is a number also measured in millimeters that you can find on the very front end of your lens normally that tells you what the diameter of your lens end piece is. Why does that matter? Because sometimes you might want to attach a filter such as a UV filter or a ND filter to make certain parts of your image dark or even a CPL filter to filter out certain to filter out certain angles of light coming in at your lens. So there's various kinds of filters of very cheap quality and very high quality that you can screw onto the front of your lens and you need to buy the right size. I've done it before. I accidentally bought a 77 millimeter and my lens was like a 68 millimeter. <laughs> and you know what I did? Instead of returning that filter, I actually bought a step up filter, which basically you screw into the end of your, your lens and it gives you a larger diameter at the end of that adapter. So kind of a clever fix. And it is nice because if you have this for your lenses, you can really use any large filter on any lens you have. Although it might look a little funny if you have a really big filter screwed into the end of a really small lens. But there are step up and step down filters that are pretty clever. All right, lens mount. This is the very base of the lens, usually metal, hopefully it's metal, that connects into your camera and it has electrical contacts if there is autofocus or any other feature that's built into the lens. And that is what usually twists it and it locks. And that's what holds the entire weight of your lens onto your camera. All right, two more, image stabilization. This is a really nice and more expensive feature of nicer lenses that physically will move a certain piece of glass inside of the lens based on how much you're jiggling and moving in the real world. So it has an accelerometer just like your phone does and it can tell if you're wiggling up and down because you're breathing or if you're walking and there's little jostles from your feet going through your hands into the lens which could produce a blurry image if your shutter speed isn't quick enough and what it does is it senses those vibrations and it cancels them out by wiggling a little piece of lens in the opposite direction if you will from the vibrations, thus keeping your image stabilized to some degree. It's not perfect, but it is really cool. If you want to see more on this, definitely YouTube some image stabilization examples, and you'll see some really cool stuff. Some cameras even have image stabilization as well, and if it does, you want to use one or the other. <laughs> Don't turn on lens image stabilization and have camera body stabilization turned on at the same time, because I've heard they can fight each other and do all kinds of crazy stuff. On your lens, it will notate if it has image stabilization, and they have specific abbreviations. For Sony, you'll have OSS for optical steady shot. For Nikon, you have VR for vibration reduction. Canon has IS for image stabilization, and Sigma has OS for optical stabilization. They're probably copywritten, so they can't use the same term, which is kind of silly, but they all have their own little abbreviations. The last term here is full frame versus crop sensor. Now this has to do with the camera bodies itself, but it does matter which lens you buy. So more expensive and more professional grade cameras are full frame, which means the image sensor is larger physically. Thus better detail, larger megapixels, better dynamic range, and just overall better performance. Whereas cheaper, more consumer level cameras like the Rebels and such have crop sensors. They're smaller and they're lighter weight. They probably use less electricity, but they have some downsides too. Now, if you buy the wrong type of lens to fit on the wrong type of camera body, you may have some damage involved. For example, in my Canon, I have to buy EF lenses. I cannot buy an EFS lens because EFS is crop sensor and my camera body is full frame. I use a Canon 60 in case you're curious. Now the reason for this mismatch has to do with physical proportions. If I buy an EFS lens, which is crop, remember S for small, at least that's what I think it is, and I put that cheap crop sensor lens on my big fancy full frame 
that very last element on the back end of the lens will stick into my camera farther than a full frame lens will, and that will touch the mirror when it flips up for me to take a photo, which can cause damage and who knows what other problems inside. I do not want that. I almost bought the Sigma 18-35 f1.8 because that's an incredible lens, but it was a crop sensor lens and I almost clicked by, <laughs> so that was a close call. So be sure to research and make sure that your lens that you want to buy is compatible with your camera body. All right, so let's get on to something that is really important for this episode. This is how to read your lens. So when you buy a lens or if you're looking at a lens, say in a store or online, this is how to read your lens and to know what all these little numbers and symbols mean on usually on the end of your lens, but also sometimes written on the top of the lens as well. So the very first thing you want to look at in a lens is the focal length. And the way that this affects your image is really has to do with how far in you can zoom or how far in the camera is zoomed if it's a fixed focal length lens, remember it doesn't move in or out, or it may be a wide angle lens, like a 28 millimeter or a 10 millimeter, which is like crossing into the fisheye territory. We'll get to that later. First thing you want to look at on the very end of your lens is the focal length, which is written with numbers and then MM for millimeter. So a 300 millimeter lens can zoom in really close or is already zoomed in very close. I could use that for wildlife. I could be super far away from an animal and in a safe area <laughs> and take pictures of it. Or I could be at a sporting event and get a football player across the field. Whereas the number is smaller, you have a much larger area that you can see within the lens, aka wide angle, such as 28 millimeters or 10 millimeters, which is so wide, the image is getting distorted into a spherical shape and that's called a fisheye. The number matters greatly. Whether you're buying a 10 millimeter or a 1000 millimeter lens, you will get very different results. And you need to understand why you need what range you need. And you may need to consult someone to say, hey, I'm doing, I want to do this kind of photography. What focal length would be good for this type of photography? And that is a good starting point as to which lens you need to buy. All right, next thing you need to look at is the f-stop, which again, like I said earlier, is the aperture size, which is variable, and different lenses have different uh, limitations to their aperture. Uh, more expensive lenses, with a few exceptions, can go very bright up to f1.8, even 1.2. And some really crazy rare lenses out there that um, are specialty lenses can go, I think there's one that's f.7 and f.95. Uh, those are going to cost about as much as a new car. <laughs> we won't focus on those in this episode, although that might be fun to do a weird lenses episode. I don't know. Um, so f-stop is important as far as how much light you have available. If you're a wedding photographer, you want to be aware that there's a lot of bad lighting situations in weddings, such as in churches or inside of rooms while people are getting ready, you know, preparation photos. And even in venues, sometimes venues do not have great lighting setups. So you're going to you're gonna need to have a lens that can get very wide, very bright, or as we say, very fast, because you won't have a lot of available light in front of you. So you've got to bump it up in your lens to compensate for that without compromising with your other settings. So can, cameras will say, again, on the very front end of the lens, um, it will have a number that might say f3.5-5.6. What does that mean? That means that the aperture is going to physically change on its own as you zoom in and out. Now, these are on kit lenses pretty much all the time. Uh, I, I may have it mixed up, but I think if you zoom in, the image is going to get darker because of the physical limitations within the lens will cause the aperture to stop down to f5.6, whereas if you zoom out or you get wider and wider to, I think it's usually uh, 28 or 18 millimeters, um, you're going to get brighter. It's going to go up to, it's going to stop up to f 3.5, which is more light, a bigger hole, right? 5.6 is small, 3.5 is bigger. Um, now, that's a really annoying. When you're zooming in and out and, you know, you're, and your image is losing light, not cool. You're going to have to compensate with settings. If you're on auto, it's probably you might not even tell because it's going to change your shutter speed or maybe your ISO to make it brighter to compensate for that. But very annoying if, if you're using manual mode. And again, that's in cheaper lenses. You buy nicer lenses, they're going to be a consistent f-stop throughout your zoom range. So you can zoom in and out at 2.8. It's not going to change. I've got a wide angle that goes from 16 to 35, and it's at 2.8, and it will not change. I can change it manually, uh, but it will not change on its own as I zoom in or out. All right, next thing is filter size. So next to your focal length and your aperture is going to be the filter size, which usually has, I think it's a circle with a line through it, which is referring to the diameter of your lens ending. Uh, and that might be 58 millimeters, it might be 77 millimeters. There's all different sizes of lenses. And if you buy filters, which I do suggest buying a protection filter to put on the end, uh, that does matter greatly because you won't be able to get it on if it's the wrong size. All right, next thing is stabilization. 
um, there is often a switch on or off, and there might even be different modes for stabilization. I think on the Canon 70 to 200 version 2 and up, I think there's two different modes of IS or image stabilization, and that has to do with how it compensates for vibrations and motion. Um, and you may want to turn that off for some reasons. Um, and lastly, there should be a switch for AF versus M on your lens. What that means is AF is autofocus and M is manual focus. So you can switch to manual focus and that will turn off the motor and you've got to do it yourself by hand or you switch it back on and the motor is going to take control. And once you get ready to take a photo, you do the half press or the autofocus button on your camera, it's going to start whirring and moving and trying to try to find a sharp image. So those are the basic functions of a lens. All right, so moving on, what lens should you buy? This is a super popular question I see all the time, and it is definitely worthy of addressing because there's no right answer. <laughs> That's why it always comes up, because there's no right answer. There are literally hundreds of thousands of lenses out there, and there's not one perfect lens for every type of photography. There are different types of lenses for different types of photography. Because of all the previously mentioned variables, such as focal length, aperture, image stabilization, and all those fun, fancy things, so you need to know what to look for in, when you're shopping so that you get the right type of lens. All right, so let's go over the different types of lenses real quick. There is fisheye, which is 8 to 24 millimeters generally. This is very, very wide. It, they can be more than 120 degrees of coverage um, from the front of your lens. So it's so warped and wide that it is uh, spherical, and that can be really cool looking. It might look awful. <laughs> you need to be careful if you're shooting at 24 millimeters or less. Uh, that you don't have any people on the edge of your image because they will get twisted and warped and look really strange. So they are great for panoramas. They're good for landscapes. They're good for real estate, um, abstract use, shooting cities, you know, uh, very just small spaces or outside wide spaces. All right, the next group is just generic wide angle lenses. This is usually from 24 to 35. Uh, again, great for landscapes and buildings and shooting inside of rooms. But do still be careful if your client or subject is on the edge of the image because there may be some distortion that will look a little unnatural. Uh, the next range is the standard prime range, which can be 35, 50, 85, or 135. Those are the popular prime lenses that are fixed focal length. But anything in that medium range, you know, between 35 and 70, is kind of a, a standard type uh, medium portrait lens. Uh, again, these are great for portraits, good for shooting uh, groups of small groups of people or individual people, individual subjects, because you you don't have to be super far away, but you're also not too close. So it's just a nice, comfortable, comfortable range. The next category is zoom lenses. These can start at 55 and go up to 200 or 300. Uh, and this is great for if you have to be very far away from something for safety reasons or privacy issues. Hopefully you're not spying on people, but <laughs> generally in spy movies, you see people zoom in really close and take creepy pictures of people. Um, and they're always black and white for some weird reason. <laughs> but those are zoom lenses, and they're great for a variety of uses, including things like portraiture and weddings. You know, you can just be shooting a solo model. You can zoom in at 200 millimeters and be super in their face. Or if you go back about 20, 30 feet, you can get a really nice portrait of their body with 200 millimeter zoom, and it just has a really great look to it. It's that, that would be different if you're using a 50 millimeter right in front of them. All right, the next category, which is kind of a subcategory, is macro lenses. Macro lenses can also be anywhere from 50 to 200 millimeters, but they're made differently than most lenses in that they can focus much closer to the lens ending. Uh, some of them you can focus as close as, as about an inch to one centimeter right in front of the last piece of glass. So imagine you've got a wedding ring right in front of your lens, or you've got a bug right in front of your lens or a leaf or something cool, small detail. Y your lens can physically focus that close and you can get really great details. Now what happens when something's close to your lens? It gets bigger in the image. I know that's kind of a no-brainer, but it, you do need to consider that. If you've got a wedding ring right in front of the lens, it's going to fill up the entire image. And if you can zoom in even closer, you could probably make, a, 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 say, a coin or a wedding ring fill up more than the image, which is almost like a microscope effect. And you can get really wild details. Now, when you're in that close, you need to, you're need you probably going to want to use a tripod so your camera isn't shaking or moving. You're going to want to use uh, narrower apertures to make sure things are in focus. And, of course, faster shutter speeds to reduce any shake or motion blur. But that's a different topic for a different episode. <laughs> so macro is focused very close. Okay, telephotos is kind of the bigger uh, world of zoom lenses used for, you know, wildlife, astronomy, sports, things like that. Those can start anywhere from around 100 and go up to 1,000, uh, more commonly 600 to 400. Those are the really big, uh, nice zoom lenses. They might weigh, you know, over five pounds. These are not lightweight or cheap lenses, but you got to have these on a tripod and they will get some incredible, incredible close-up images of things very far away. 
So that is the six basic categories of lenses, fisheye, wide angle, standard prime range, zoom, macro, and telephoto. So back to the main question, what lens should I buy? My first question to those people is, what do you want to photograph most with this lens? Now they might want to do a whole bunch of stuff, but if they're looking for a specific photography category, they need to know that there's probably one or two really good lenses for that category. For example, if I'm going to be shooting uh, large families, let's say five people and larger, you know, up to 30, 40, 50 people parties at a wedding or a, a, some kind of event, and I'm going to get really big group family photos, I should not buy a 50 millimeter. <laughs> I should not buy a 100 millimeter. Big waste of money right there. You will not be able to capture a large group of people with anything uh, longer than 50. Uh, you should definitely invest in a 16 to 35, I would suggest. You might want to get a wider angle if you're okay with some distortion or if you can get back really far. Uh, but yeah, anything from an 18 to 35 is a good range for large groups, large open spaces or small spaces where you want to capture an entire room. You definitely want to get into that wide angle territory. Okay, so that's larger groups of people. If you're photographing individual people or small groups, maybe, you know, five people and less, um, but definitely for individual people like models or uh, headshots or whatever, uh, you can do really good with a prime lens, like a 50 millimeter or an 85 millimeter. Those are really nice. I'll, I'll, a 35 is nice too, but I, I don't really prefer that because of lens distortion that's introduced with that wider um, focal length. But I really like the 50 up to 100 is really great for solo photos. Now, if you're at 100 millimeter and you've got a group of four people, you're going to have to back up quite a lot and it might be uncomfortable. You might not be able to communicate to them or you just might not have enough room to walk back that far. So there are limitations. There's no perfect lens. Uh, there's downsides to everything. And you need to be aware of those limitations and use them actually to your advantage. All right, so if you're shooting sports, you're going to probably want a, a zoom lens, like a 70 to 200 is a really good starting point. Uh, there are some other zooms out there that get in closer and can still shoot, you know, kind of bright. If you're shooting uh, sports in the evening or at night, you're definitely going to want a fast lens, which would be, you know, f2.8 at least. Now, if you're doing nighttime photography, like let's say astrophotography, which is, you know, shots of like the moon and stars and the galaxy and stuff like that, you're going to want both a wider angle lens and also a fast lens. So a fisheye lens is, those are pretty commonly used by astrophotographers. And it's going to need to be one that can go to f2.8 or possibly 1.8. Now, if you're doing longer exposures, that does change things. You're probably going to want to shoot at like, you know, f5.6 or 9 or 16 or something you know, real small but you are going to want that wider angle to capture a large sky area or nature landscape with, you know, maybe the horizon silhouette or something with the galaxy behind it. All right, so that covers, you know, generally just kind of a concept of knowing what you're shooting, how far away it is, how close it is, and how much light you're going to have to work with. And also there's the other details like, am I going to need image stabilization? Like, will I be moving? <laughs> will I be running to a spot, stopping and taking a photo? Will I be, you know, will I be tired? And is this a long day? If so, your arms are going to be weaker. You're going to be more shaky and not, not as stable. So uh, consider that as well. <laughs> All right, so let's get into the fun stuff. Uh, what lenses do I use? Um, I do not have uh, crazy expensive lenses, honestly. I have uh, kind of what I consider my holy trinity of lenses. You may disagree, but this is what I use. I use a 16 to 35 f2.8. Now, I use this lens for small rooms, like the bride getting ready. Uh, if I'm doing a party in a building, I'm probably going to use that because it can get, you know, a whole group of people and I don't have to back up a whole lot and hit a wall and trip and fall over something. Uh, so that lens is great for small room areas. Uh, I also use it for dance floor photos at weddings because I can be about two or three feet away from someone and they actually don't mind. And uh, the wide angle looks really cool. It, it's fun to look at. Uh, you can see their whole body generally. You can see people behind them and around them. And uh, it's just is a nice look for the fun moments of a dance floor. Um, I also use this if I'm doing a landscape or a building like the outside of a church. It's very large and tall and I maybe can't go far back because there's a street behind me and I don't want to get run over. So I'll use my wide angle lens and I'll get the whole thing in one shot. And it has a nice look for architecture and large buildings. My second lens I use is the 50 millimeter f1.4. So my 50 millimeter is kind of used for a lot of things, mostly portraits, of course, especially individual portraits where I want a good amount of blur behind behind them, or if I want to blur something in front of me, I will, you know, stop down uh, to maybe f2 or f2.8. I usually don't actually go to f1.4. I found that it's not super sharp. And honestly, I do think my lens does need some uh, calibration. 
uh, which is a kind of a reset and a, and a double checking of all the elements, making sure that they are aligned correctly to get the sharpest possible focus. I think mine might be out of calibration because I've had it for about like seven or eight years <laughs> and I've used a lot. It's actually been through a few drops and repairs already. So um, there's that. I use it for portraits, uh, small group portraits, you know, maybe three or four people. I will have to be about 15 feet away or more. Um, I'll use it in dark areas as, as well because if, if worst case scenario, if there's just no light, I will go to f1.4 or 1.8 to get a nice bright image and it has of course really shallow depth of field which would be at 1.4 um, or around that range and I can get you know one thing in focus and everything else in front or behind it will be blurry and that might be a really desirable effect but it also might be undesirable depending on what you're shooting okay and my third lens that I use is my 100 millimeter f 2.8 now, this is a macro lens, actually, and it is killer for ring shots and nature and bugs and just details and stuff like that, which is really fun. I like doing that. But because I can't afford the 70 to 200 just yet, uh, I think it's about $3,000 or $2,000, somewhere in there. I haven't even shopped for it because I know I don't want to spend that much money yet. <laughs> but that's the normal lens that wedding photographers use and people like, do events because it can go in and out from 70 to 200, which is a nice range, and 2.8 is nice for a low light. But I don't have it yet, so I use the 100 millimeter, which actually does a really good job. I can be at the back aisle of a wedding and still get a full body photo of the bride and groom at the very front altar. And like I said, it's multi-purpose. I can focus super close and get uh, rings and details and cake stuff and flowers and fun things like that as well. When I use it for our solo portraits, it has a really good amount of compression. And compression basically means how much the scene is compressed from the farthest away point in your image, uh, whether that be the horizon or a building behind you, uh, to the closest point, uh, which is right in front of your lens. They can be compressed closer together, visibly at least, uh, when you use a longer focal length. Whereas if I use a wide angle, things are going to look very far apart and stretched and warped and like, whoa, things are really far away, but they're really not. You can find some really cool visual examples of what this looks like going from compressed to not compressed or warped uh, on YouTube if you look for that. If you put it into video form, if you move a video camera while it's recording away from a subject as you zoom in or to the reverse, you move in close as you zoom out, it gets a super trippy bending effect called vertigo. And actually, just go and YouTube that. <laughs> Look up vertigo in movies, and you'll see some really cool examples of what compression really means in a real-time setting. And those are really cool. I do have a fourth lens. It's the 28 to 75 millimeter 2.8, and that's a Tamron lens. So there are other brands out there that make lenses for your camera that are not the original brand. Sigma and Tamron are probably the most popular. And their lenses are cheaper in price and sometimes in quality, although there are some really great, very well-received and well-loved lenses made by both those companies that cost uh, much less than the, you know, Canon or Nikon versions of those same same focal lengths. So I actually bought the 20 to 75 before I had the wide angle because I realized I could not shoot indoor events. <laughs> I could not shoot parties in a house. I could not shoot small rooms with the bride and groom getting ready. I just can't. I can't even get a big building and because my 50 millimeter was such a limitation. And so I said, all right, I got to spend some more money. I need to get something that will uh, give me more opportunities and possibilities. So I got the 20 to 75. It was only like three, 400 bucks, uh, which is cheap for a decent lens. And it served its purpose. But I soon after found some guy retiring and he sold his 16 to 35 and his 100 millimeter to me both for about half price. And that was just amazing. Uh, what a steal, what a blessing, and I love those lenses even more for that because <laughs> I didn't spend my whole savings on them. Here's a hypothetical situation here. What would be the perfect lens? If I could magically create a lens that would serve every purpose, this is what it would be. You may have some additions. I'd like to hear what you guys would consider a perfect lens. But for me, I would be happy with a 10 millimeter to a 300 millimeter f1.0 with image stabilization and low dispersion glass. So that would be sweet. 10 to 300 would be like super fisheye, up in your face, get the whole scene around me. 300 would be super far away, stalker, creeper photography, <laughs> which I don't do. <laughs> and F1.0 would be super bright, uh, very, very shallow depth of field, maybe a few millimeters that would be in focus if it's close up. Um, and they'll disperse this clear image around the edges. So that doesn't exist. And if it did, it'd probably cost about ten, twenty thousand dollars and weigh probably 10, 15 pounds. <laughs> uh, a few drawbacks there. <laughs> but uh, just put it out there. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I know it's different. Uh, it's something that I've wanted to do for a while. I just haven't quite had an opportunity because I've been moving in this week. I, we were just, I was so busy. Nate was also busy because he got a new job. Angela was busy. I just said, hey, guys, I know this is weird, but let me just do a quick solo episode 
episode of something photography related. Um, so we can have an episode for next week and we'll get hopefully get back on track next week for the next following episode. And I said, yeah, sure. Why not? So they let me have some fun. <laughs> they let me out of my cage. So again, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned something. If I have confused you, if I have said something wrong, which is definitely a possibility, I can be wrong. My wife reminds me all the time. It is a very high probability. <laughs> so if I said something wrong, feel free to email me at tvvpodcast at gmail.com, or you can personally message me on any of my social medias uh, as Daniel Grove and Daniel Grove Photography on Facebook and on Instagram. I am Daniel Grove Photo. Any questions, comments, additions, subtractions, multiplications, uh, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> let me know. I would love to hear from you guys. Okay, I'll let you go. Thanks for listening and have a great week. With us today, we've got Angela, the girl who's a figment of her own imagination. Hey. Hold on, let me redo that. My voice got caught. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs>